Good afternoon. I just want to do a quick video. And it's about the work that myself and others do uh, specifically around culture and culture change. And then as an end result for other practitioners who work around equality, diversity and inclusion. So yesterday I was in, uh, in conversation with a lady online and um, in, in many respects, I, what I had done is I put out a post that I said a lot of organizations, I think it's important for them to, rather than rush out a statement, have a conversation um, about how they want to be able to shape uh, policies and procedures and messaging around equality in the workplace. Now, with the, um, the aftermath of George Floyd killing and subsequently the resurgence of Black Lives Matter protests and, and more widely the conversation around anti-Black racism and, and the issues that many Black um, individuals face, I thought it was important to put this point forward because a lot of organisations immediately did a knee-jerk reaction, threw some stuff out and didn't even realise that they were undermining a lot of the staff that they represented by just saying, we stand with you and we're going to support you and they never even had a conversation. Uh, and whether it's around race and ethnicity or around gender, LGBT, ability, age, class, or any other protected characteristics that are in a workplace, how are you really going to release a statement if you haven't had a conversation with the staff that you're represented to? Is it because you just want to do good marketing and good PR? Or are you seriously saying to those staff that we understand your voice, we hear your concerns, we want you to know that we belong. So let's have a conversation first so that if we do send out something, we can do it with measurable stats as to how this can be done. And there was some pushback, uh, both online and uh, straight to me and through some messages that I received as well. And I want to explain my thinking behind this because I think it's so important. Um, so for a number of years, I have worked in this space. And I've had the pleasure of being part of a wider collective of consultants who work around behavioral change, um, who work around organizational psychology, who are coaches and counselors, who are DNI practitioners, who are leadership practitioners. And uh, over the space of years, we've been able to collate a number of reports that have affected all those protected characteristic groups from orientation to age to gender to ethnicity and, and one of the things that we've been really conscious of is making sure that when we are there representing the voices of others um, so that they don't have a cultural burden for having to explain everything to, to, to organizations that we do so in such a way that is evidence informed and that uh, primarily has a uh, not only a response to a situation but metrics and outcomes and behavior changes and practices that we can measure and hold people to account for. And as such, it's important that individuals realize if you just react to that, you're dishonoring those individuals who you say you're going to represent. If you've never had a conversation with them, then it's problematic. And so I think of the individuals who I've worked with specifically around um, orientation, LGBT+, and a number of organizations who would take it upon themselves to put up the rainbows and be at pride organizations but when you look at their senior leadership team or even if you look at their pipeline or even if you look at the attrition rate of individuals who have left because they've had homophobic reactions you realize hold on a minute on the one week you're out there doing all these flags and, and celebrating lgbt but the reality is when we look at the data a lot of lgbt people have left your organization because you are homophobic and you've done nothing in your policies or procedures or language to really sustain being um uh, representative. For example, you know, I know of organizations where people have said, you know, look, I'm, I'm here to support you, but I don't agree with your lifestyle. Do you know how offensive that is to somebody who is queer or trans or, or any other orientation that's not straight? And if that's something that's going to be tolerated in an organization, you have to start thinking about the language. What do you mean you don't agree with the lifestyle? It's a sexual orientation. It's not something, uh, you know, a lifestyle is what you wear, how you choose, where you go out, the things that you it selectively choose if you are uh, or have a, a sexual orientation you don't choose that that stuff nobody goes along on a list and ascribes that to you that's that's what you have it's within your dna it's within your makeup and likewise when we start to have the conversation around gender you know it's important that 
um, great, these organizations will say, you know, we want to have 20% 20 more women on board. And, and, and so we hold those organizations accountable. We make sure that when they are making decisions or when they're looking across recruitment or what have you, that they do that, you know, and do it accordingly. So coming back to the conversation I had yesterday, I thought it was really important to give a couple of examples of what it actually looks like in practice. So let me talk, talk about some of the ones that I know. Let's take, for example, Soho House. So Soho House, large um, international um, creative arts um, membership organization um, who realized after um, a lot of challenges that they had that they were able to sit down, have town halls and conversations with their staff around what was the voice of not just black, but other indigenous and people of color um, across the Americas and Europe and other, other places where there was that representation. You know, what could they do better? And having had the conversation and having spoken to staff, they then released a pledge. And that pledge detailed how over and above the national average, they were going to make sure that the, the workforce was representative of talent across the pipeline. So from your um, level entry, um, support front of house staff, all the way up to senior leadership, they made a pledge and a claim in order to make sure that there was more representation of their staff. Take Lloyds Bank. Lloyds Bank is another example. And they have been working at this for years, long before all this thing kicked off they were working around BAME representation and making sure that there was more representation in what is more of a traditional um, a banking industry here in the UK. They made the effort that they were going to put a stake in the ground and say, right, we're increasing this. We're going to, you know, we're going to actually um, make the effort. And even after this um, incident kicked off with, uh, which has sparked the, the um, anti-black racism movement, uh, what they realized is that when they started talking about BAME, they were over-indexed with South Asian representatives and leadership which wasn't really fully representative of BAME as a whole. And so they made a stake in the ground and said by 2025 that they wanted to have at least 3% of their senior leadership and across the board in their staff, more black African and Caribbean individuals in a space of representation. One final one I wanna give you is Netflix. And so the billionaire Robert Smith challenged a lot of organizations in the US to put at least 2% away of their funding so that they can support and look at the infrastructure of supporting um, black communities. And because they realized that the wealth disparity, which is a lot of, which is, you know, part of what anti-black racism feeds into, uh, the wealth disparity between blacks and whites. And yes, you know, we can talk about the difference between the model minorities like, you know, uh, the Jewish community and the South and Southeast Asian communities in the, in the US. It's a totally different conversation. What they realized is that by putting their money where their mouth is, you know, Robert Smith said, you know, this is a way of being able to shift it. So what did Netflix do? They deposited 100 million pounds in black owned banks and they also put money towards um, college funds of towards historically black colleges and universities in the US. These for me are empirical. These for me are data driven and evidence informed decisions that people are making. Yes, there are going to be individuals that are still going to push back and go, well, you know, meritocracy, you know, I'm colorblind and I don't see these things. But for the individuals like myself and others who have pulled down from information from McKinsey, we've seen the research coming out of business schools like um, Holt. We've looked at, um, you know, historical data from uh, the Pew organization in America and, and a number of other organizations like the Running Me Trust here in the UK. Um, and, and, and so many other organizations have been working on racial disparities and inequity for a number of years, as well as the surveys and the polls and the focus groups and the town halls and the facilitations and the conversations we have had here. That's why it's important for us to be able to go, look, don't just do something reactionary, do something that's long lasting and sustainable that talks and feeds into cultural inclusion as a whole. And so, as my friend Jane Evans reminded me, you, you, you measure twice and you cut once. And it's not just about doing this gut reaction and trying to do something which looks really good for optics and you think that, you know, whether it's black people or any other kind of underrepresented minority in your organization should feel really pleased or grateful for. No, like any behavior change, like any organizational change, this is about sitting down, having a conversation, incrementing, trying and testing, understanding why it's important. And then once you've come to that decision, because you know you cannot make a good decision without data, but once you've come to that decision, using and pulling down on all the resources that you can do, then together with your staff collectively, that's when you start to make statements. And not only do you make statements, but you have commitments in there as well that keep you accountable. What are those targets? How do you recruit? How do you make sure your policies are inclusive? 
how do you make sure that when you're working with schools and universities and doing internships and, and when you're developing your leadership pipeline and even the kind of media that comes out of your organization, you've done it because you've welcomed people who are part of that stakeholder group that is often underrepresented to have a voice at the table. That's why we don't like knee-jerk reactions. And that is why myself and so many other people who are working tirelessly in this area to make sure that there is a sense of balance to make sure that for the individuals who start to talk about equality and, and that it's open for all and it's about hard work, we recognize that there is an imbalance and sometimes you have to be able to go in and do an adjustment. So I just thought I'd share out these few notes and thank you for all the customers who I work with who have been willing to go on that journey, to look at the data, to look at the evidence, to think about what are the bigger conversations that need to be had. And, and, and for all my uh, colleagues in this space who are doing the same, it's really appreciated because everybody wants to be treated like a human. That's it at the end of the day. Thank you very much for listening.